going to jump right into the Word. I believe I'm here on assignment. I did tell Pastor Tyler, I said, man, I've been, so, I've been gone so long. Are you sure you want me to preach? You know, I've been gone. The ceiling might fall in on me uh, if I, when I walk into the building. How many ever had greeters that when you're out of church for a little while, they say, be careful, you know, lightning might strike. I, I, I think we, we train our, lead, our, core, our uh, greeters not to do that. And so I've got a word for you today. I'm glad that you're here. And we're going to open up. We're going to jump right into it. I'm on assignment. My word for you today is simply, I have come to put you on Kairos watch. I have come to put you on Kairos watch. And I know that we're in a series on unity. And I'm going to I asked Pastor Tyler, I said, I have a prophetic word. He said, can you give me permission to go? He said, yeah, just connect it to unity. So I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to jump right into it, and we'll go right after it. First Corinthians chapter 3. Guys, if you could put it on the screen, if you got it on your phones, we're going to read verse 1 through 9. And we're going to kind of set it up for you. And I'm not going to be long. Stay with me through the whole message, because I've got something I'm going to, uh, illustration I'm going to do at the end, and I believe it's significant for what God is doing in this place. First Corinthians chapter 3. You know, the first, the Corinthian church had two of the longest letters because this church is so jacked up. They are all about the anointing. They are about shouting. They're about miracles. They're about healing. They're about the power, but there was no character, none. Paul is constantly having to address their lack of character. They were cliquish. They had favorites. They showed favoritism. They preferred people over one another. There was division. Somebody say division. I mean, a division is the opposite of unity. Come on. And there was all kinds of perversion in that church. In fact, Paul had to rebuke them in chapter 6 for incest. Paul is not talking to the folk in the street. He's talking to the church. And it is a church that is not made up of perfect folk. Jesus said, I have come to seek and save the lost. So the next time that you think church is for perfect people, let me know that the church is not for perfect people. And if you have issues and problems in your life, you're in the right place. Come on, somebody. You are welcome here. I've always said if you ever walk into a church that has a sign that says for perfect people, then the very fact that you're there will mean it's not perfect because there is nobody perfect for him. And so they are picking their favorite preachers, they are talking about who I follow and which one I don't. Paul is writing to address all of this stuff. And this is the first century church. They are fresh out of the gate and Jesus has not been gone long. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And we're going to start in verse, actually we'll start in verse 3. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as carnal. I mean, no, that's a harsh word, carnal. As to babes in Christ, I fed you with milk, not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and every na even now you are still not able, for you are still carnal. He says, you've been with me for a little while, you've been in church, but you're still carnal. For where there is envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal, and behaving like mere men? Did you notice that he says when you're not in unity... You step out of the supernatural that God has created you to be, and you are no longer extraordinary. You are ordinary. Come on, somebody. For when one says, I am of Paul, and another says, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos but ministers through whom you believe? As the Lord has given to each one, I planted, watch this, Apollos watered, but it was, come on, read that with me. Say it again. God gave the increase. How many know that? Let me just stop there for just a minute. I cannot give you increase. Now, when I talk about increase, I'm not talking about prosperity. I'm not talking about finances. I'm talking about increasing in every area of your life. How many know that I can plant and you can water, somebody else can water, but it's only God that can bring the increase? If you want increase, he is the only one who can make it happen. If God is not in it, how many know it will not increase? So then verse 7. 
So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but it is God that gives the increase. How many know that God is a God of increase? Y'all got to talk back a little bit. I'm used to, in Texas they would say y'all, and they would throw shoes at me. And in every state they had talked different, but they were, they were, come on, I need you to talk back. Talk back and say hello. hello. See, God is a God of increase, and increase is not mediocrity. It's not staying the same. He is a God of increase. If God is in it, it will increase. Go to the next verse, verse 8. Now who plants and he who waters are one. Each one of them will receive his own reward according to his own labor. Verse 9. For we, this is the key, we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. Now when he says fellow workers, we, he's referring to the fivefold ministry. The apostles, the prophets, the pastors, the teachers, and evangelists. He's talking about your pastors. He said, we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. Who is God's field? Yeah. You are. He said, you are God's building. Let me know that this is not the building. You're the building. That's a whole other message in itself. In other words, watch this. Increase does not come. It only comes from the field. It does not come from the worker. If God is going to bring increase... It will not come from the guy with the microphone. It's going to come from the field, which is you. In other words, you are the place where increase comes from. Until it hits you, it's not a move of God. If it just hits Pastor Tyler, if it just hits me, if it just hits the children's workers, it is not a move of God because then it is coming through the workers and God said, I am bringing increase to the field. It is not till God sends something through me and it impacts you that it fulfills God's purpose. In other words, only the field can yield the increase. The worker cannot yield the increase. Somebody say this. Increase is going to come through me. On your job, increase is going to come through you. In your neighborhood, increase is going to come through you. It's not good enough for me to prosper if you are broke. Let's go deeper. It's not good, good enough for me to be free, but you're bound. It's not good enough for me to be in peace, but you're afflicted. It's not good enough for me to be healed if you're sick. Why? Because increase is supposed to come to the house of God, not the workers of God. Come on, y'all can do better than that. How many know that's a good word? It's not a real move of God until it hits everybody. You are God's field and you are God's building. Let's go ahead and pray. Close your eyes. Father, I thank you for the presence of God in this room. Lord, let me deliver this word and let it cause an activation of supernatural faith to know and recognize the season that we're in and step into it with everything that is within us. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Now, yeah, give God some praise right there. I know I'm a little different than Pastor Tyler. It's hard for me to stand still, but today i got to just to stay on track. Now, the message of the kingdom, Jesus was obsessed with it. It was all that he talked about. He was obsessed with the kingdom that he would bring. He said it would start in the hearts of men and women. Isaiah said it would, he would bring a government, and of the increase of that government and peace, there would be no end. There would be never-ending increase. I was just with a pastor who was just giving excuses about why his church did not, was not growing. And he said, it's okay that it's not growing. But how many know when God is in it, it will grow? Yes. There's never-ending increase in God. There is no place called there. Now listen, when we finish this building, it does not mean that we have arrived because increase, God is a God of increase, and when you get ready for, when you increase comes, you get ready for more increase. And when increase comes again, you get ready for more increase. I don't care what level you're on, there's about to be more increase because of the increase there will be no end. Get the limitations off of your mind. Get the limitations off of your thinking. Get the limitations.
limitations off of your mouth. Get it off of your faith and your life because there is no place called there. There is no place where I've arrived and I am there. Listen, when you are born again, your journey of increase has begun. Get ready for an adventure of increase. If you want increase, somebody take a minute and say hallelujah. hallelujah. Give God some praise. Come on, how many want some increase in your marriage? Yeah. See, God lets you live life on levels and experience life through seasons. And how you manage the seasons determines the level that he takes you to. Ecclesiastes, write this down, says everything is perfect in its time. See, every blessing has a time expiration on it. It's not my responsibility to determine my season. It is my responsibility to recognize my season. And it is my responsibility to understand what season I am in and manage it well. Watch this. Don't ever forget this. The seeds for promotion are in the managing of the season that you're in now. We know that now that we know that God is a God of increase, there are two things that he wants to increase you in. Number one, he wants to increase you in faith to faith. Somebody say faith to faith. He wants to increase you in glory to glory. Somebody say glory to glory. Glory is actually weight. It's not a smoke cloud. It means weight to weight. In other words, he increases the impact and the influence of your life in the earth. How many know he wants to increase your influence? Come on. How many know he wants to increase your impact? See, listen, what I, what I say today carries more weight than it did last year. Why? Because this light and momentary affliction is working for me a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. If the devil knew how heavy I am, I'm getting, he would leave me alone. Because every time he tries to affect me, I'm getting weightier and weightier and weightier. So what I speak today, when I speak bigger mountains move, and when I speak bigger giants fall, and when I shout more giants get their head cut off, why? Because I am growing in the glory, I'm growing in the weight, and he's taking me from glory to glory, and he's using Using my enemies to do it. Woo! So we understand I have to manage my present season properly to graduate to my next season. How many know he wants to he wants to increase you in faith, greater faith? What does that mean? He wants to give you a greater a new capacity to believe on a greater level. He wants to take you to a greater level of impact. He wants to give you greater levels of capacity to receive from him. So he's taking you to greater levels of faith. So for God to bring increase, he takes you from one level and he lets you experience it through seasons. How many are glad that God didn't let you experience it all at one time? Come on, really, that's a blessing. That's how I lost all my hair when I got all the, everything at one time. Come on, that's a blessing. When loss comes, when bad news, he doesn't let you experience it all at one time. He lets you experience a little bit at a time. How many know that God heals you in seasons? For some of you, it took a little time for God to help you get over him or her leaving. It takes time to heal over that loss. It takes time for God to pull you out of some things. It, it takes time for God to bring restoration. And he doesn't let you feel it all at one time. Why? Because he is merciful. Listen, if God let this church get to the end without going through the process, when we got to the end, what, what is at the end is so big it would crush us. I know I'm yelling. Y'all looking at me like, come on, I'm just wild. I'm wild. I, it's hard for me not to be wild. We understand that the seed to my promotion, I'm trying to slow down, is in the handling this season properly. Last night I was up all night because he was trying to take my breathing. I had a hard time breathing, but I believe God's touching my body right now. I believe God's healing somebody in this service during worship. I, heard the Lord, I felt a pain in my lower back, which was not there before. And I heard the Lord say, I'm healing people that have chronic pain in their body today. Amen. See, 
We understand the seed to my promotion is in the handling of my present season. And when a season comes to a completion, another season does not start till the last one is finished. In other words, God does not put you in two seasons at one time. How many are grateful for that? To everything there is a season. There is a time for every purpose under heaven. So God has life perfectly set by a time called seasons. Watch this. Everyone in this room right now is in a season. And we are all in different seasons, although this church is in one season. And I'm here to announce that you're coming to the completion and the end of a season. And a new season is about to begin. And some doors that have been open in the past will never open again. It is coming to an end. And you will not have to fight that battle any longer. You will not have to deal with that depression any longer. You will not have to go back there again. Why? Because one season is is ending and a new season is beginning yeah. let's go deeper you know you're coming to the end of a season because the end of a season is marked by a test a test is not a season watch this a test is not a season it is a small span of time between two seasons and it is marked by being short but it is very intense Come on, watch this. You know it's testing time. Watch this. Because it is the time that God goes silent. Why? Wait, let me say this. A test does not come for you to learn anything. A test comes to evaluate what you've already learned. When I was in school, I never took a test that taught me anything. I wish it did. It did teach me something. I better study. Not depend on osmosis or ask the Holy Spirit to help me remember. He did not say that he would remind you of what the teacher said. He would remind you of what Jesus said. And Jesus said, prepare always. <laughs> Listen, it's, a test is not given to evaluate if I've learned anything while he was talking. Oh, it, it is given to evaluate if I learned anything, if I was listening when he was talking. And a teacher goes silent during the test, and God gets silent in a test. But I've got a word for you today. God has, has shut his mouth, not because he is mad at you, and he has not lost his voice, and his throat is not sore. It is because you are in a test, and if you fail... You will have to go back and repeat that season. But I mean, what the good news? If you pass the test, God is about to open a new door for you, and a new glory is about to be released from your life, and a new faith is about to dawn. Somebody shout, Next! I, I heard the Lord say last night when I was going to bed, he said, your nets looks better than your now. If you'll just be faithful, if you'll just keep showing up, your nets looks a lot better. Listen, you look a lot better in your future than you do right now. So let's, let's review real quickly. I'm actually doing really good on time. I've almost... <laughs> Number one. I'm even going to use points. Usually my messages are like a, a, a cow, what do they call the cow little thing? There's a point here and a point there as you try to go through. But usually my points are not like this. Number one, God is a God of increase. Number two, God moves you to levels through seasons. Number three, seasons have to be managed properly to qualify for the next promotion. Number four, when a season is completed, you go through a test and you know you're in a test because God shuts up and he will not talk and you feel like your prayers are bouncing off the ceiling and you feel all alone. But I'm here to tell you this morning, God has not left you, but you are simply taking a test and the teacher is silent during the test. Let's go, how many can go a little deeper? Listen, I call it shucking corn. Now listen, please hear this. There's so much in here, you can just take one point. The intensity of your life will increase in proportion to the intensity of your level. I'm going to say that again. The intensity of your life will increase in proportion to the intensity of your new level. There are some of you that feel like 
God has hid you and you are not visible and you are not seen. I've been sent by the Lord today to tell you that hiding you is a blessing. It is God that gives the increase and that means that you do not promote yourself. Why? Because if you promote yourself, you may be seen before you are finished and you may be put on display before God is done. So God hides you while he's doing his work and he finishes you before he takes you out and increases you. Why? So the, the hiding is a blessing so that you can have all of your mess ups in private when nobody is looking. Whoa, I mean, you're glad that you can, God will hide you and deal with the junk in your trunk before he opens it up and reveals it to the world. That's why I'm 52 and he's still working on me. See, before God is going to put you on display, he will not do it till he's finished. And if not, your junk would be on display before he finished you. Some of you in this room are frustrated with low-level responsibility. But low-level responsibility is a snapshot of your future. Why? Because you will, have to, you will do the same thing, but it will be on a higher level, and you have to manage the low level well before God can take you. And if you don't manage it well, you will repeat it. Are y'all with me? That's why the Bible says anything that your hands finds to do, do it with all of your might. If you're part-time or minimum wage or you're the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, do it with all of your might. Why? Because God tests management where you are now. And if you pass the test with faithfulness and excellence and a good attitude and you're not grumbling and complaining and fighting to see who can get the best seat, come on somebody, and you honor those around you, you're showing up early but leaving late, then God will promote you. And when God promotes you, no man can demote you. When God exalts you, no man can pull you down. When God opens a door, nobody can shut it. Yeah. Woo. God, God is going to do something in your life that no man can mess up, including you. Let's talk about Joseph. Joseph at a young age was interpreting dreams, but he was not visible. He was with his brother interpreting dreams. He was in the father's house interpreting dreams. He was in Potiphar's house interpreting dreams. He was in prison because he was falsely accused. What was he doing? He was interpreting dreams. And God is polishing him in a hidden state because finally his gift takes him to Pharaoh and his gift moves him to another level because he learned how to handle, watch this, the seasons of disappointment. Managing the seasons of disappointment. Somebody, how many have ever dealt with some disappointment? Managing, so I want you to say that, managing... The seasons of disappointment. He dreams of his brothers bowing down, but he's behind prison bars. Managing the seasons of disappointment. See, listen to me. It is the blessing when God hides you, when your life is hidden, because you get to be polished. Why? Because God is polishing you and preparing you for the next level. See, God did not change what he was doing in Joseph's life. He was doing the same thing, but he was doing it on different levels until finally God brought him to be ruler over all of Egypt. What was God doing? He, what was Joseph doing? He was doing the same thing on a hidden level, and God had polished him in secret, and then God put him on a visible level, and he remained faithful, and God took him from faith to faith. I got a clock up there. Praise the Lord. He took him from faith to faith, and he took him from glory to glory. I cannot see anything right now. I don't know why, but I cannot see anything. God is a God of increase. Somebody say he's a God of, God of increase. And up on his increase, there is no end. Why am I telling you this? Because this is not where you're going to be. This is not your next. This is your now. 
God can take you as high as you can manage. And when you fail to manage your increase, it stops, not his increase. He is a God, I know I'm repeating myself on purpose, who has no end of increase. The only thing that stops increase is your ability to manage the level that you're in. Don't tell me when you get a full-time job or you get that dream job, you're going to be a good employee if you're not a good employee part-time. Don't tell me you're going to tithe when you get more money if you're not tithing now. Don't tell me you're going to preach hard when you get, I think you got a great preacher, one of the best. And I told people as I was traveling, there's a young man in Cartersville that's, man, he can preach. He's got revelation and he's going to, and that thing is going to shake cities and nations. But let me know that you have to be faithful on the level. You got to preach as good to a small crowd as you do a big crowd. You got to do it when nobody's watching. Just like David took care of the sheep and wasn't even invited to the promotion party. What was he doing? He was polishing when nobody was watching. David did not promote himself. When Samuel came to his house to anoint the next king, he didn't force his way in because if it's your time, you don't have to promote yourself. God will come and find you. Some of the greatest churches in America started out in a place like this that nobody knew where it was. But there were some people that said, I don't care if there's a hundred. I don't care if there's a thousand. We're going to go after God with everything that's in us because we know that God started this and God will finish it. And he's a God of increase. Yeah. Woo. I'm skipping some stuff. I mean, when it's your time to be promoted, God will come find you. We need to understand the role of enemies. I mean, you got some enemies, not people, but you got some stuff in your life. You got some obstacles. Samuel took the horn of oil and he anointed David in the midst, somebody say, in the midst of his enemies. And David penned the, my favorite psalm. He said, God prepares a table in the presence of my enemies. Why? Because when you see an enemy, that is an indicator that your promotion is near. It's also an indicator that God's presence is near and that he's going to anoint your head with fresh oil. I mean, though, you don't have to go to the oil. The oil will come and find you. I just, I just want to comfort some people today. To those of you in this room that are in a test, how many feel like you're in a test? Just wave your hands at me. To those of you in a test, it is the fact that God is doing all of this in your hidden state. It is a blessing, and your frustration needs to subside because it is God's blessing covering your life. I'm almost finished. See, the same forces that let a toddler ride a tricycle are the same forces that let somebody ride a three-speed. They are the same forces that let you ride a 10-speed. It's the same forces that let you ride a 25-speed. It's the same forces that let you drive a moped and a motorcycle and eventually a Harley Davidson. Come on, somebody. The forces that cause you to ride those are the same. But the biggest jump is not from the bicycle to the Harley Davidson. The biggest jump is when you take the training wheels and you go to none. It's when you take the wheels off. Go ahead, Mama, get the band-aids ready. He's about to crash. But God has designed it for them to crash on a lower level because if you crash on a little bicycle, you might skin your leg. But if you crash on a motorcycle, you might lose your leg. See, God wants to take you to a big place, but you haven't been faithful. I'm not talking about you, but you haven't been faithful in a small place on a smaller level. Therefore, God has not completed his work in you, and you're about to promote yourself to be put on public display without being finished. You need to make sure you can ride a bike that has training wheels before God puts you in a big thing and displays you publicly. Are y'all with me today? Am I in the right church? Amen. So if we're coming to a completion of a season and we are at the point of a test, then we have to understand that we're in a moment. It is not your job to decide your season, but you do have to discern it. 
if the keyboard, Robert, will go ahead and come. Just, I'm almost finished, but stay with me. This is the most important part. There are two words for the time. I want to be like Tyler, so I decided to dig up a little Greek. Because I love, I love it when he does that. Parts my, if I had hair, it would part it, but it, I don't have any hair. Parts my whiskers. There are two words for time in the Bible. Number one is the word chronos. And the second word is kairos. There's actually four, but I'm only going to deal with two. The Bible says there was a Shunammite woman who was barren and had built a room for the prophet Elijah. I remember when you preached on that, preparing a room. It says, it says in the text, it fell upon a day. That is chronos. It's the word chronos. Chronos is a calendar day. It, everybody in this room has the same chronos. It is 60 minutes or 60 seconds in a minute. It is 60 minutes in an hour. It is 24 hours in a day. And in Africa and Europe and America, everybody has the same chronos. It does not change. It is calendar time. It is day by day, minute by minute, and hour by hour. Your watch, how many got a watch in here? Your watch is a chronometer. It measures chronos time. And it says it fell upon a day because she had built a room in the house when the prophet said, what will you have me to do for you? She said, I have no child. And he prophesied about a year from now, you will bear a son. Why? It came upon a day that God would take her into a season. In other words, about a year from now, in your chronos, a kairos is about to hit you. Now, what is Kairos? Kairos is a moment in time. It is an opening. It is an opportune time. It is the word for opportunity. And he told the woman, he said, in a year, and I'm here to tell this church today. I believe God put me here to tell you this. In a year, in your chronos, God is going to interject in your chronos at Kairos, and there will be an opening, there will be an opportunity, and this Kairos will be an opportunity for you to boast something that up till now you have not been able to produce. Oh, come on, give God praise right there. You need to grab that. See, the key to your day-by-day, day, minute by minute, hour by hour life, which seems so unadventurous. It seems so unimportant. It, mean, it seems so invisible. It seems so not needed. It seems so little important. It is in those moments that Kairos has appeared. And the day that David got carried uh, into the streets of Jerusalem on the shoulders of the soldiers with maidens hanging over the balcony singing songs about his name. You don't want to know what he was doing? He was delivering cheese and crackers to his brother. Others. What would happen if you just learned how to carry the cheese and the crackers? We are looking to be giant killers, but listen, David was not waking up that day saying, today will be the day that I will become a national hero. No, he was taking the opportunity that was in front of him and said, I'll do the best I can with this opportunity just to manage and deliver crackers and cheese. And well, in the process of in his chronos, he ended up becoming a kairos moment that he became a national hero. Why? Because God took his minute by minute, his hour by hour, it's day by day, and introduced an opportunity, a Kairos moment, and I've come with a word, stand on your feet this morning, but stay with me, I've come with a word for you today, that God is putting you on Kairos watch. God is putting you on Kairos watch, and I'm not just talking to this church, I'm talking to individuals. Some of you, by the end of the year, you're going to own the business. You're going to own the field that you've been laboring in, like Ruth. Been picking up handfuls on purpose. But you're going to get so close to Boaz that Boaz, is, 
his attention is going to turn towards you and he's going to end up giving you the very field that you own. I believe that there's some of you that are renting and all you've ever done is rented. You never owned anything. And God says, if you'll be faithful in this year, I just hear the Lord saying, you just stepped into a season. You've just stepped into a season, but I want to declare to you that this season is not going to be long. There's going to be an, a kairos that comes into this kronos, and there's going to be a supernatural grace to do something you never thought you could do. And I heard the Lord say during worship, this place is not going to hold what I'm about to release to you. And it may, it won't be very long. And you'll say, where are we going to put another chair? we got to tear down this wall. we got to tear down this wall. We got to do this and that. Not, there's no room for the people. God said, don't worry about the money. Don't worry about the people. Just get ready. You're in a Kairos, but your Kairos is coming. Some of you may be bored out of your mind. I know you dread punching the clock one more day. I know you hear the alarm and you roll your eyes and say, not another day of a job I cannot stand. But this morning I'm here to put you on Kairos watch. Listen to me. Please hear this in your spirit. Put your hand on your belly and I want you to receive this in your spirit. God is about to bring unforeseen opportunities. And he's about to open doors. And you're going to have an entrance into a life that up till now you could not birth no matter how hard you try. I declare that big things are going to come out of a small place. You are not hedged in. You are not constrained. You are not held back. You are not limited. You are not locked up. Your kairos is coming. I really felt that for these pastors over here that have joined. I feel like it's been a season where you've Things that you've attempted to try to do that just, that it was so hard and so difficult. But I hear the Lord saying, because you have obeyed me, I'm about to interject the kairos in your chronos. And when I do, it's going to change the trajectory of your life. And the Lord is going to do such a work in your extended family. And he's going to build a bridge between Georgia and Florida that's going to change those two states. Get ready. God's got bigger things than you think. I know you got time and weary because of what you've been through. But God says, don't be weary, son. I'm about to open the doors for you. I'm about to change the scenery. It's not going to be what you think it is now. This is not your next. This is your now. And your next is coming. You're in the right place. When you hook up, when Mary and Elizabeth hooked up, there was something dead that was in Elizabeth begin to leap. And I hear the Lord saying, I'm going to cause the dreams in your life. This is not just for them. I want you to throw your hands up and close your eyes. There's some dead things that are about to start leaping. Oh, there's businesses that you tried before and it failed miserably that God's going to say, I want you to do it again. I want you to try again. I want you to look again. I know that you don't see anything back then. You did what I told you to do and I, you have been proven faithful and now you're going to birth something that's bigger than what you thought. It's bigger than what you thought. It's bigger than what you thought. Somebody say big things are going to come out of small places. How many of you in this room have a word that has not yet happened. Raise your hand. How many of you got a promise that's not yet happened? How many of you got a prophetic word that has not yet happened? A promise that you've waited a year for. Some of you have waited years for. I don't know who it is, but I had this, I, I have a grace on my life for people that are trying to have babies that are married. I gave an altar call in the last church in Texas. People ran. And I said, wait a minute, who are married? I had to clarify that because we live in a different world. How many know that? There's some of you that if there's somebody in here, either now or in your future, you're, gonna tr you're, be, you're trying to have children and you're not able to, and the doctor says you're not able to. I hear the Lord saying that grace is going to come on you supernaturally to give birth to what you thought was dead. 
I feel like that's for some marriages in here. I feel like that's for some families. That's for your finances. The Lord gave me an illustration. You know, this is a garage door opener. Let me see it. How many got a garage door opener? I'm pushing the button. There's a little red light. And how many know that when I push this button, there's no doors that are opening? How many know that when I push this button, my garage door is not opening? My garage door is 17 minutes from here. It's not, it's not doing anything. But this, there's nothing wrong with this remote. This remote looks brand new. The batteries in it are good. My door and the garage thing that's in my garage is not broke. It's, it works fine. My home has not lost power, but the door is not opening. Have you noticed that the Bible says through faith and patience you inherit the promise of God? The Bible says it's through the vision, though it tarries, wait for it, for it surely will come. The Bible says that to those who wait upon the Lord, He will renew their strength. But here's my question that I asked the Lord. I said, God, why is there waiting to a word or a promise? Let me ever ask that. Why do I have to wait? I've been waiting for years. But what's, what makes this remote, I want you to think logically, what makes this remote not work right now even though I'm pushing the button? Proximity. Somebody say proximity. See, there are some in here that say I've been confessing. I've been giving. I've been fasting. I've been doing everything that I know to do. I've been tithing. I've done everything that God you have told me to do, but I am frustrated because it's not yet happened. See, what you don't understand is that Joseph got a vision as a boy, but it wasn't until a hundred seasons later that his dream came to pass. You have to be faithful. Listen to me. you got to be faithful. No matter how long it takes for that word to come past, you got to keep pushing the button. Come on. Right now I'm pushing and nothing's happening. But here's what happens. If I push the button right now, watch this, nothing's happening. But if I push the same button while I'm driving up my driveway, the door begins, is opening and allows me entrance. Why? Because the reason your door has not yet opened and your promise has not yet come to pass is because you are not close. But I hear the Lord saying, you're pulling up into the driveway right now and you are closer than you've ever been. You're closer than you've ever been. I'm closer than I've ever been. If I would just keep on speaking, come on. If I'll just keep on showing up, if I'll just keep on working, if I'll just keep on praising, it's going to come to a callous moment. When I push the button, the door's going to open. Somebody shout, I am close. Come on, high five through two or three people around you. Say, I am close. God is birthing faith in this room to stay the course. Stay the course. See, what level you're on is not significant. It's knowing that you're coming to the completion of a thing and you are passing your test. And if you do, you can hit the button because you're close enough for the door to open. And there is no place called there. There is a process and it's called increase. I want you to open, hold your hands out just for a moment. I'm going to give it back to him. I feel like there's some prayer time, but I want to, do, I want to release this. There's some, some of you in this room that are facing discouragement. Because your moment has not yet come. Because you feel like you're stuck. And I want to declare to you, you are not stuck. You're in a process called increase. Just like God increased Jesus, He increased in stature. He increased in wisdom. He increased in, in favor with God and He increased in favor with man. And I want to declare to you that this, though your beginnings be small, your latter end shall be very great. I heard the Lord say, I, am, I'm, I want to read one thing to you, and this is, then I'm going to give it to Him. I, I asked the pastor who's in a, a friend of mine that's in another city, another state. Just, it was uh, last week. And I said, 
you know, I read the Bible a lot. I read it. Sometimes I read it leisurely. I read it from cha through chapters. You can look at me. Don't be afraid. I'm, I'm finishing. Sometimes I read it based on where I feel like the Holy Spirit wants me to read. Or sometimes I go back to places that have fed me before where it's nourished me and it's become a wellspring of life. And I go back and feed myself again. But I felt led to reach out to him and say, what do you think I ought to read today? It's a man that's very close to God, probably more of a man of prayer than any man in, I have ever met. He said, I think you should read Isaiah 54. So I, I got the Passion Translation, and I want to read this because, and I want you to hold your hands out. As I read it, there's going to be an impartation. I want you to listen. I want you right now to forget about the buffet. It's only 11.46. We're almost done. But I want you to focus on what I'm saying and I want you to let these words resonate. I didn't come to give you a word today only. I came to give you an impartation. Because as I read this, limitations are going to be broken. Discouragement is going to be broken. Cloudiness of vision is going to be broken. And there is going to be a release of joy to enjoy the process and the journey. Listen to me. You cannot wait. If you, if you go through the process of seasons and you do not have joy in that journey, when you get to the place of arrival, you will have no strength to give birth to what God wanted to birth. And God said, I want you to bypass. I'm going to use this building as an example. I want you to bypass what's not finished. Don't worry about what's not finished. And just keep focusing on me, the finisher. Because let me know that what God starts, he finishes. He that has begun a good work will complete it. And that's a bad translation in the Greek. It's he that has com completed it when he begins. It's guaranteed it's done because he's already walked it out. That's why Psalms 35, 27, he orders your steps into what's already been finished. He doesn't tell you to start something and then you get in the middle of a storm and you say, God, I don't know what to do. God says, I already put something in the storm. I put peace in the storm. I put provision in the storm. See, God knows your end, your nets before you even started. And the very fact that he has started you is a guarantee that he has finished it already. He's already finished Awakened Church being what God has called it to be. And it is not, this is not your nets. This is not the end. This is process. I'm probably preaching more to you than I am anybody. It's process. Who cares if it's not finished? You know what the cool thing is about this not being finished? Is every day, every week when you come, and even during the week, those of you that think, you know, I haven't been here, so I can't. When he when he said that I couldn't applaud myself, but I could applaud you, and I actually felt guilty, man. I wish I'd have been here. Because when you're not here in the process, when you get to the end, you can't enjoy the glory. When you haven't been faithful, when nobody's been here, when you get to the end, you can't shout over what's finished. Why? Because you weren't there you got to be willing to deal with it when it's ugly before it gets beautiful. Come on, somebody, and just stick it out. Not that this is ugly because it's not ugly at all. This place is beautiful. But here's the word. Hold your hands out. Increase is coming. So enlarge your tent. Add extensions to your dwelling place. Here's the key. Hold nothing back. Make the tent ropes longer and the pads stronger. This is my word for you. You will increase and spread out in every direction. Your sons and daughters will conquer nations. There's some of you in this room that right now you're not even, you don't even see yourself in the ministry. You just think you're a worker that's at a job. But the Lord is anointing you to go and take nations. The disciples were not apostles overnight. They started as disciples. Who had to often say you of little faith. And they became the apostles that turned the world upside down. There are people in this place that are going to turn the world upside down. Let me hurry. Here's the key. You will increase and spread out in every direction. 
Go like this. What is it? What's going on? Come on, do it by faith. What's going on? You're making room for the big. You're making room for your expansion. You're making room for the increase. When you feel him in and you feel like things are tight and you feel like there's some empty seats and you feel like things are not moving along as like they should, just start doing this. I'm just making room, room for the big. This thing can't hold me. This building cannot hold me. This job cannot hold me. This, this neighborhood cannot hold me. This house I'm renting right now that I don't even want to be in is not holding me. My government is not holding me. I serve a government that's higher than any government. And though the economy may be going in hell in a handbasket, my my God is able. My God is able. My God is able. And when God does it, when God does it, Brandon, they're not gonna, you won't be able to say you did it. You'll have to say God did it. Woo! Oh, do you feel that? God is about to do something in your life that when people look at you, they're gonna say there's no way he could have done that. That had to be God. Tell God that right now. God, do something in my life. It's so big, I can't take credit. Your sons and daughters will conquer nations. And you will revitalize desolate cities. You'll revitalize. What's cool about this is I did not know this was in there. And the term, Brandon will attest to this, a word that I use 150 times a day on the phone is revitalize. The word revitalize means to take something that is and to make it a thousand times better. To take something that doesn't work and take it, turn it into something that's powerful. The Lord is going to use you in your job, in your neighborhood, in your city, in your region, to bring revitalization, he's going to cause God's glory to be seen. And what looks like a mess is going to become the greatest miracle that the world has ever seen. God is getting ready to revitalize some dreams. He's getting ready to revitalize Cartersville. And Cartersville is going to be a city that people will come from everywhere and say, you know what? I met, your, your, I met him. I met her in this city, in this nation, on this job. And I had to come see the glory that they carry. Where is it coming from? God said it's coming from here. And it's going to cover the globe. Give God a praise right now. Come on. Give God a praise. Give God a praise. 